So we're starting a new series today called The Forgotten Creed, The Forgotten Creed. And for those of you who like to read scholarly books, which I don't know if that's very many, but uh, <laughs> just Fred maybe, but anyway, uh, this book is called The Forgotten Creed. So I took the title from this book and the subtitle, Christianity's Original Struggle Against Bigotry, Slavery, and Sexism. And so I highly recommend this book by Stephen Patterson. Did a podcast interview with him. You could check that out as well. But yeah, we're going to dive into the book of Galatians. The passage that I'm going to do four weeks on is out of the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. And I'm going to read that here in just a moment. But first let me say a couple of words about Paul, the apostle, and then Galatians, the, the book that we're going to be reading from. And then we'll look at the passage itself and then kind of just unpack. This is kind of an introduction to this little short creed that is embedded in one of Paul's books that predates the Apostle Paul, actually. This is, this is an ancient, small creed that was a part of the Jesus movement earlier than the Apostle Paul, even. Now, here's what's interesting. Us scholars who study the Bible and the New Testament, one of the things we do in scholarly circles, in nerdy circles, you know, is we, we, we talk about books of the Bible and who wrote them and when they were written and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Most of the books of the Bible existed as oral tradition first, and then years later were written down, sometimes by scribes, Pharisees. They were edited and then collected and then disseminated, okay? So like Moses, we don't have any of Moses' original autographs. And there's lots of debates around the Torah that's attributed to Moses. Uh, interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul is attributed to books in the Bible that probably aren't Paul. So, for example, Galatians is definitely the Apostle Paul. The book of Galatians is the earliest book in the New Testament. It was written about 48 A.D., which if you think about Jesus' crucifixion 30 A.D., this is less than 20 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, and Paul wrote the book of Galatians. So if you really want to know Paul, read Galatians, and you're getting not only early Paul, but also early Christian tradition in the book of Galatians. What's interesting is like there are books that were written after Paul's death that are in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul like 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. They're attributed to Paul, but probably not Paul. This happens all the time. The book of Ecclesiastes is attributed in the Old Testament to Solomon, but not Solomon. So this, this would happen when a book was brought into the Bible, and it would be given a name of somebody that didn't know, but probably didn't come from that person. But anyway, that's behind the scenes stuff. But the reason I say that is because some people really struggle with the Apostle Paul. Um, there's several issues that Paul tackles, and if you look at them, sometimes it looks like Paul himself is contradicting himself. Like there's passages in the Bible where Paul says for women to be silent. Be silent, church. Don't talk in church, women. And you just talked in church, right? Didn't you just greet each other? Are we disobeying Paul, right? On the other hand, Paul says, hey, women, when you prophesy in church, cover your heads. You're going, wait, what, what? How do you prophesy and be silent at the, you know, and all, you know, so you have these interesting things. So what's interesting is this, in Jesus's movement early on, he had women leaders, women supported him financially. Read Luke, Luke eight, and you'll see that it was women who supported Jesus. Women were in leadership. And if you look in the early churches of Paul, Women were in leadership. Women were gifted spiritually. Women financially supported it. They were in the leadership of the church. It was interesting as the Christian movement developed, some people then began to suppress the voice of women in the church. And so anyway, that's just one example, okay? So my point here is that when we go into Galatians, we're dealing with, first of all, the earliest New Testament book that exists, 48 A.D., and when we read Galatians, you're reading Paul and Paul's early thought and what Paul really, really cared about early on. And this little creed that Paul put into Galatians is a fascinating 
little creed. So let's read it. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. And Paul, remember, in Galatians, is arguing that Gentiles, so who are Gentiles? Everybody that's not a Jew, right? Every other person on the planet that's not Jewish is a Gentile. Paul was saying that Gentiles could be equally followers of Jesus and in the community of God's people just like Jewish people. And his big, big point here, and this was really challenging for for the Jewish people, because Jewish identity markers were things like the foods you eat or don't eat. There are clean foods and unclean foods. Another big Jewish identity marker was circumcision. Circumcision. So, if you wanted to be Jewish and a man, like if you were a Gentile and wanted to convert to Judaism, guess what you had to do? (laughs) Right? Circumcised. Like, like as an adult, man. Have have any of you ever seen the movie One Year? Year One came out in 2009 with Jack Black, Michael Cera. You got to watch it. Don't Google this now. But just, just, just Google Jack Black and circumcision. And when, when Abraham first gets the idea, oh, we're going we're gonna to get circumcised to show our commitment to God, Jack Black is in the audience and he's like going, uh, uh, Abraham, you might want to rethink that a minute. I think you had a little too much to drink. Why don't you sleep on that? Let's, we can make this decision tomorrow. It's hilarious. So I would show it, but... I think it's a little, yeah, it's a little edgy, all right? Anyway, <laughs> a little edgy, but funny. Check it out, all right? Just don't Google it right now, all right? <laughs> anyway, so Paul was actually arguing that you could come into the family of God and, to the fo- and followers of Jesus and be fully adopted into the family and not have to be circumcised. Whoo! As, a, as an adult male, right? So the Gentiles really liked that. The Jews weren't so sure about it. And they argued over it. And they fussed over it, right? How much of the Jewish cultural laws do you have to adopt to follow Jewish Jesus? And this was a big, big debate. So Paul actually argued that you didn't have to get circumcised. In fact, Paul even argued that there are... He, he affirmed the Torah, but he said there's things about the Torah that are no longer uh, applicable for all people. And so he's like saying, you no longer have to be under the law when it came to certain cultural ritual purity. You could come in and be fully accepted, not by obeying the law, but what? By having faith in Jesus. And so by faith, you are adopted into the family, not by circumcision or the foods that you eat or don't eat, and this kind of thing, right? So this was Paul very early on. So no longer are you under the law, and then now Paul goes on and he adds this baptismal phrase that's more ancient than Paul. And Paul is quoting here, okay? So he says, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So he's talking about what? Jew and Gentile, right? And then he says, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Then listen, there is no longer, remember you're no longer under the law. Now he's going to say, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. And the Greek actually says, there's no Jew or Gentile or Greek, you could say Greek either way. No Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female. For you are all one in Christ, and now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. Pretty radical statement. So I'm going to do an intro today of this passage, and then next week we're going to focus on no Jew and Gentile. 
Uh, and then next week after that, we'll focus on no slave or free. And then next week after that, we'll focus on no male or female. Okay, so that's kind of the four-week layout of this series. So, fascinating stuff. By the way, Paul is arguing that if you're a follower of Jesus, then these distinctions which are classical and historical distinctions of people and human beings, actually aren't reality. They, if you're a follower of Jesus, these distinctions shouldn't exist in terms of dominating power structures and roles. Paul is going to argue right here for radical egalitarianism in all of the human race. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then you should be a radical egalitarian. I think Jesus would have said the same thing. Now, so Paul's arguing as a follower of Jesus and saying, hey, if you're a true follower of Jesus, then you shouldn't be recognizing these distinctions that other people, that separate people. You shouldn't recognize those. They're not reality. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Like if you go into Hinduism and you think about the class structure in Hinduism. How many of you know there's a rigid class structure historically in Hinduism? But if, if a Hindu teacher was trying to convince Hindus that you shouldn't recognize class, all right, then they might say something like this. We're all one in Brahman. Why? Because Brahman is the big Hindu concept of God or reality. It's the word for basically what we would call God. And so they say, there is no distinction in Brahman. We're all one. So in Brahman, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no male or female. There's no slave or free. This would be kind of the way that it would be argued if you were trying to convince Hindus not to recognize class distinctions. If you were, um, you know, Muslims have contentions with each other. The Shiite Muslims fight the Sunni Muslims. The, Arab word, the Arabic word for God is Allah. Some people get, get weirded out about that name, but Allah is just the Arabic name for God. If you translated the Bible into Arabic, instead of using the Hebrew or Greek words for God, you would use the Arabic word, Allah. And if you are arguing for no class distinction within the Muslim faith, you might say, hey, in Allah, there is no Jew or Gentile. Slave or free, male or female. So Paul is arguing for this early Jesus follower community to actually recognize solidarity with all humanity and no power differentials, but to actually be radically equal all as children of God together. So let's just say this historically, and the title of this message, The Oldest Cliché. Historically, almost all of human history has been patriarchal. We can hardly find any cultures where they were matriarchal, but, but some actually existed, but most were patriarchal. And then most divided everybody into us and them, us and them, us and them. And if you're afraid of them and you want to just be us, and you're afraid of them, then you implement power structures of dominance to suppress them because you fear them. So this is a lot more about power structures and dominance and fear even than it is about uh, gender or these kind of things. It's actually about roles in egalitarianism and equality and dominance and power and so as we dive into this, we want to recognize that when Paul says this and he quotes this, it's actually referencing one of the oldest cliches in human history. You can go back before Socrates. You know, Socrates was the guy that discipled Plato, and Plato was the guy that discipled Aristotle. You can go back before that, and there's a guy named Hippomus of Smyrna, and this is way before Jesus. And this is, the, this is the cliche that existed in the Greco-Roman world. It says this. Hippomus said this. First, he gives a blessing. He said there's three blessings to be grateful for. And he, he gives gratefulness to fortune, the god fortune. This is in the Greco-Roman world. 
And Hermip, uh, Hermip, I'm saying his name wrong, Her, Hermipus of Smyrna. All right. Yes, yes, yes. You said it right, but I'm, I'm, anyway, so here's what he said. Three blessings grateful to fortune. First, that I was born a human being and not one of the brutes, which would be slaves. Next, that I was born a man and not a woman. And thirdly, a Greek and not a barbarian, which would be anybody else except for Greeks, right? So that was pre-Socrates. That's one of the oldest cliches. That cliche moved over into Judaism. Rabbi Judah said this, there are three blessings one must pray daily. And of course, only a, a man would pray this, right? And it's, here's, here's the prayer. This, there are three blessings one sh- must pray daily. Blessed art thou who did not make me a Gentile. Blessed art thou that did not make me a woman. And blessed art thou who did not make me uneducated, or that would have been the word for slave, okay? So we're talking about race, class, and gender. Now, interesting, historically, when we talked about race, people tend to talk about physical distinctions. So like if you trace uh, physical distinctions back, you would have the continent of Africa, which would have common physical traits. You would have the Asian continent, which had the Caucasian, European continent. You would have the Native American. That would be North America, Central America, South America, and the indigenous peoples of America. And then you would have the Asian Islander Pacific type folks. Those are kind of like the five major old ideas of race that were typically based on physical distinctions. Then we talked about ethnicity, Ethnicity historically was based on cultural differences, things like language and culture and food and religion and things like that, right? What's fascinating is with genetic research now, what most people are coming to is that both race and ethnicity are social constructs, even race itself. We could take uh, a person from Africa, a person from Asia, a person from Europe, a person, uh, an indigenous person from Native American person. We could take an Asian Islander. We could do a genetic study on them. And about 99.8% of our genetics would be exactly the same. Literally, exactly. Like, you wouldn't find distinctions. And so most people even think these ideas of race our social constructs. This is kind of like a new thought. What's fascinating to me is that the Apostle Paul seems to uh, be advocating for this. Is this like there's there's literally there's more that connects us than separates us. We are interconnected in ways beyond what we can even imagine. Think of, you know, your body. If you just break it down into chemicals, is basically stardust. The same stuff that makes up stardust makes up your body. You could do a genetic research. You about 60% identified with a banana genetically. And uh, you would be, uh, uh, we, we people in this room, and if we included everybody around the world, we would be genetically almost the same, literally. It's just so fascinating. But historically, what have people done? They grow up in a tribe, and then anybody that's not in your tribe, they could potentially be the enemy. Right? So like I, like I know a lot about Ethiopia. I've been there a lot. Uh, there's 80 tribes in Ethiopia. The three largest tribes are the Tigris, the Amara, and the Om- Oromo. And uh, those three big tribes fight each other for what? For power. But, you know, ethnically and even racially, they're almost the same. You can't, I've been over there, you can't tell them apart, except for maybe the language, because there's tribal languages, okay? So Jews grew up othering, looking at other people, right, as different, other, and there was a fear to that otherness. Jews othered everybody that was not Jewish. Greeks 
othered everybody that wasn't Greek. Romans othered everybody that wasn't Roman. This is kind of the way the world has worked over and over and over again. And then there's power structures. Like humans dominate animals. Men rule over women. And this dominance is how we try to control what we fear and what's different and what's other. And so it's about roles and power structures. And Paul is simply trying to say that, hey, we are actually all children of God. And as followers of Jesus, we really shouldn't recognize these distinctions in terms of a way of separating and othering one another. I think we should celebrate diversity. There's infinite diversity in fingerprints and snowflakes and everything on this planet has infinite diversity. We should celebrate that, but we should also realize that there is an interconnectedness to every single person. And if we're going to walk in love, then we're going to realize that we have a whole lot more in common than we ever do that separates us. And so the bottom line for Paul is he's saying, hey, we are all children of God. And Paul actually echoes back when he says no male and female. He's actually echoing back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, 28, where in that original creation story, what does it say? You are made in the image and likeness of God. Male and female, equally in the image of God. There's no hierarchy. There's no power structure. And when we get into that, there's a whole lot more interesting stuff about that passage than that I'll bring out when we get to that. But Paul's basically saying, hey, we are all children of God. We're all made in the image of God. We're all people of dignity and worth. And that is what unites us, and that's how we're interconnected. And we should always show solidarity with all human beings as a primary way to live in love. The way of Jesus is love. And this is the way we break down the things that separate and divide when we recognize the solidarity of every human on this planet. We are all children of God. You know, there's a oneness and an interconnectedness that I think if you study the mystic tradition of Christianity, the mystics recognize this. And it's fascinating that there are mystics in every tradition who recognize the oneness of all humanity and at the same time recognize the beautiful, infinite diversity, creativity, and generativity of the whole human Race. It's a beautiful, beautiful kaleidoscope, if you will, tapestry, if you will, of diversity, infinite diversity and creativity. Yet at the same time, we are all interconnected. And so Jesus is calling us to the walk in this kind of love and solidarity. So how do we live? Well, we live in love. And we work as followers of Jesus to break down the things that separate us and move into the things that unite us. So we do this in all kinds of creative ways. But I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that every human being on this planet is made in the image of God. I think that tells me that there's something that I can learn from that person, something that I can benefit from that person. There's something unique in every single person that represents the multifaceted beauty of the God of this whole universe. And as we dive into relationships, how many of you have a pet that you love dearly? All right. How many of you have a dog? How many of you have a cat? How many of you have dogs and cats? Now, see, now we got the people that are doing what I'm talking about right here. <laughs> you have dogs and cats. You know, you're, you're getting closer to Paul now, okay, right? <laughs> How many of you feel like your dog loves you unconditionally? How many feel like your cats could take you or leave you? <laughs> I had a lot of cats for a while, and uh, yeah. They always wanted me, and then uh, 
Yeah, and then I didn't fall in love with cats. I won't tell you the things my dad used to say about cats when I was growing up. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, uh, the thing I love about my dad is if I love something, he'll end up loving it too. So, you know, he even, I think he even up loved my cats, although that might be a stretch. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You have to ask him. Here's a couple of quotes to close us with here. Jesus, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. This is Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, John 17, before he goes to the cross. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. The Sufi mystic Rumi. Why struggle to open the door between us when the whole wall between us is an illusion. Interesting. Here's one from Julia, the mystic Julian of Norwich, was a, was a sister nun in the Middle Ages. She says, the love of God creates in us a wanting, W-O-N-E-I-N-G. I think that word's made up. But instead of othering, a wanting. The love of God creates in us such a wanting that when it is truly seen, no person can separate themselves from another. And then I want to close with a prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, another favorite of mine. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. There is a way to live in Jesus that begins to recognize that every single person that we encounter is a child of God, a person of worth and dignity. And we are called to find ways to love, love God, love ourselves, love our neighbor, and the most difficult one of all, love even love your enemy. Whew. So this is a challenging way to live, right? Especially in the culture today where everybody's divided and everybody's hating everybody and it's just craziness. This is a summons to a deeper vision of what this human race is all about. So let's pray. God, come and do a work in us today. Move in our hearts. Where, where we've put up walls, where we've put up barriers, we, we've hated, where we've othered, where we have uh, feared the other because they're different. And then we've sought ways of privilege to dominate and have power and to separate and all of that. God, may we recognize that these are really just illusions and that we're one. We're children of God. And that as followers of Jesus, we're called to just walk in solidarity with humanity, move in the power of love, and break down the barriers. Let us do this together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Calvin's going to lead us in a song of reflection.